Та як ви прориватися будете через блокпости сепаратистів? Вам це на камеру розказали. Серед місцевих жителів все ж таки руйнування просто фізичного якогось майна. Ви відчого ви сюди їдете? Дело в том, что эта история это только начало более такой серьезной истории. Это все еще только начинается. Технологии, какие вы предлагаете. Не, ну это че. Так а что вам взагалі говорить? Кто вас вызывает? Я ничего не говорю. Но тем не менее, наша задача как журналиста передавать реальность такой, какая она есть. Это будивля службы безопасности Украины, которые утримывали большую количество заручников. Мне нужно герой мой дома! Живи! Ви не оглохнеше? Good evening from studio here in Kiev. This is the Sunday show on Ramadska International, the only primetime English language program covering the Eastern European geopolitical storm. I'm Ian Bateson. And I'm Angelina Karyakina. Tonight we will be covering several topics as usually. We will talk about one year since the Malaysian MH17 was shut down over Donetsk. We will take a closer look into the new appointments in Odessa. Recently Saakashvili's uh, team was joined by a Russian opposition politician and we will have her soon in the studio. We will also talk about a very special uh, arts project on war from Donetsk and we have a number of um, interviews with the leading analysts and politicians from all over the world for you tonight. And always I want to remind you that we have our podcast on SoundCloud now, so you can download that and listen to all of that uh, whenever you want. And then as always, we also have our app for Mac devices and Mac computers where you can get the best of our videos, uh, explainers, and of course, the Sunday show. So a year has passed uh, since the Malaysian airline MH17 was shot down over Donetsk, killing all 298 passengers on board. As the world is waiting for the report and the official investigation led by the Dutch Safety Board, five countries cooperating on the investigation, which are Netherlands, Malaysia, Ukraine, Australia and Belgium, are calling for an international tribunal. The United Nations Security Council vote on the tribunal was postponed these days and actually is expected to take place on July 27th which we're really looking forward to cover. On uh, Friday, Ukraine's President Petro Poroshenko has ordered into creating a Ukrainian uh, working group that should deal with international legal mechanisms on how to prosecute and bring to justice those responsible for the shooting down of the plane. Uh, and on Friday, uh, a memorial service organized by the Dutch embassy here in Ukraine was held uh, in Kiev. Mozart Requiem by Ukrainian Letushinsky Ensemble and the Dutch conductor Dr. Jeroen Vernik, speeches by the President Petro Poroshenko and the Dutch, Malaysian and Australian ambassadors. So let's take a look at our short video from the memorial service.
Now, since Malaysia Airlines flight MH17 was shot down in eastern Ukraine, the OSC Special Monitoring Mission has been working to ensure access to that site from different investigators, different groups trying to look there, gather materials, send the belongings of people killed back to their families. Uh, and our own Natalia Gamanyuk earlier in the week sat down with Alexander Hug, the deputy chief of the OSC Special Monitoring Mission to Ukraine. So we have that for you now. So thanks a lot for um, talking to us. And how do you assess a year after the work of the uh, your mission uh, back then at the site of the crash and also the access to the um, crash site and the cooperation with the Ukrainian authorities while speaking about the, this tragedy? The OSC Special Monitoring Mission has two concrete uh, tasks within its mandate. One is to report on the situation on the ground and make these reports available to the participating states of the OSC uh, and the public in general, as well as the conduct of dialogues on the ground. Uh, and the two pillars in the mandate that were given to us by the participating states, these two pillars also guided our work with regard to the downing of MH17 a, a year ago. Uh, there we have facilitated for those who wanted the access to the crash site and on the crash site itself we have been reporting uh, regularly uh, to the participating states on our findings and how we saw the situation changing on the ground. And what were the main challenges uh, Special Monitoring Mission faced uh, while working both on the government controlled mm -hmm. side but also on the side which is, was controlled by the separatists? Uh, specifically for uh, this operation, we had no specific uh, obstacle on the government side. Uh, the crash site itself was in the beginning uh, deep within uh, so-called DPR-controlled territory. Uh, and at that time, of course, the biggest challenge was then to reach the crash site, navigating and negotiating through these rebel checkpoints along the way until we have then reached the crash site, which was an area the mission has not uh, visited before. It was the first day the mission has ever been there in that specific area, so it was new territory for us, and they were also rather complicated for us. Later then in the operation, the contact line, or the front line if you wish, moved further south um, towards the crash site, and indeed actually led across the crash site in the end, which made the work of us monitors and that of the Dutch-led uh, mission and also that of the journalists very dangerous and often had to be interrupted because the fighting actually was being conducted on the crash site itself uh, in the later part of the operation on that site. How do you describe this thing? We all remember very, very well the, the, these images of you working there, of your colleagues. So what was there? It was a pretty unexpected place. So. What were the people feeling? How it looked? How would, uh, how the people talked to you? Well, uh, it, it is true we have been arriving there. Uh, we were not the first ones on the scene. The, the rebels themselves were there before. Uh, lots of journalists were already there when we arrived. We came just within 24 hours. The plane has actually crashed on that site. Uh, we drove onto the main crash site, uh, which was also a site where there was a lot of fire. Uh, the burn site, as it has been referred to later on, and we have seen when we were approaching the site, the debris already from the distance, uh, big parts and big chunks of the plane, plane lying there in the, in the fields. And when we came closer, of course, we have seen more of the devastation, including the bodies lying across the field, exposed uh, to the elements, as well as their personal belongings that you can, could immediately see on that stretch of road that led through the crash site, on which side on both sides, we have seen these items lying there. It is, of course, also a, a traumatic uh, event also for those uh, residents that lived in these areas. These are small villages, they're not big towns, small villages. They experienced this coming down of this aircraft. We have been speaking in the, in, the, in the days after our arrival there to local inhabitants that were just living next door to where the plane came down and burned in high flames. Uh, and they, of course, uh, ex told us the story how they've seen the plane coming down. And they were also traumatized because they also have seen these bodies lying there in the open in the hot sun until they have then been removed some days into the crash. Well, we have, uh, throughout the period, apart from our reporting on the crash site itself, we have been providing access through our dialogue facilitation with both sides. 
and the work that has been done by the Dutch-led uh, recovery mission has done different phases. It has recovered the bodies, of course, which we have also facilitated, also the transport of these bodies. The OEC Special Monitoring Mission has facilitated. They were loaded up in Torres, being brought uh, through rebel-controlled territory with us and the Dutch-led uh, mission on board that train, then crossed into government-controlled territory, and then ended up in Kharkiv, from where the bodies have been flown home to the Netherlands. We also have been facilitating the collecting of the personal belongings of the victims. Uh, that also has been done through our negotiations with uh, the rebels there on spot. And also the transport of those belongings by train to Kharkiv was also done by us. And at the later stage, also the recovery of uh, the wreckage parts themselves has, has also been facilitated by us, including the transport. And we continue to facilitate access for whoever has access to the sites. But it's important to mention here, if I may, is that the investigation or the work itself is not conducted by the mission. This is conducted by those that are competent to do it. We facilitate the access of these experts to the sites and also report on what work they are conducting these reports have been made available to the public. Is there anything the Ukrainian government can do at this stage or anybody else, any other side? Well, the cooperation with uh, those that are competent to let this investigation is key to success. Uh, the OEC Special Monitoring Mission offers its good offices to facilitate the dialogue on both sides of the contact line to make sure that those that have the mandate to look into this incident and to work on this incident have proper access so that they can conduct and implement their mandate properly. How it changed your work, how it changed your mission, but also you, uh, because we're all human in the end, yes, yes, yes. observing all this. First of all, we have proven as the OEC Special Monitor Mission that we can actually gain access and that we can allow others through our facilitation to gain access. We've also shown that with our presence and professionalism as observers, we could give some dignity back to those that have lost their lives there, and we could show uh, those at home waiting in the Netherlands and Australia and from wherever these uh, deceased people came from, that there was someone there that could report objectively of what actually happened. Myself, of course, I have not seen before an accident of this scale. I have seen many warlike situations elsewhere. I've seen death uh, elsewhere, but I've never seen the combination of a accident or incident of this scale combined with a conflict on the ground. That is something I will not forget, and certainly not when I'm flying a plane and these pictures always come up again. And we're back in the studio to present another interesting video for you that we've prepared um, recently for you. It's, um, a, it's, it's a topic, it's a legal issue, and we've uh, talked to Ivana Bilic, General Counsel for Razum, together for Ukraine. Uh, we have been talking to Ivana on, uh, the, on human rights situation in occupied territory, particularly in Crimea, and uh, whether it's possible at all to take to an international court a case like annexation. So let's take a look to that video. What is actually the legal situation that people of Crimea are fi finding themselves right now in? Uh, what are the, the basic uh, things that, uh, let's say, uh, make them feel helpless legally? Uh, under which code of rules, under which laws are they actually in reality? Uh, the fact that the situation uh, changed so rapidly and the Ukraine uh, is, a very liberal with is a very liberal regime with respect to human rights and Russian Federation, uh, the occupying power and uh, the facto power right now uh, is uh, um, mm, the absolute uh, opposite of that. And people uh, do know what exactly to expect, what uh, exactly they are dealing with. Uh, uh, and so this is the major problem. So uh, that's why we try to explain to people what their rights are with respect to occupation. I because even during the occupation, their human rights don't cease to exist. Mm -hmm. So which law should they actually... Um and, and under which laws should they actually live and whom should they address 
um, address their any any legal requests. Is it is it the, the law of Russian Federation of, of Ukraine? How how should it work? It's a hard question because there is a question uh, which law it should be and which law, uh, law it is. Because under international law, Russia is an uh, occupying power. So uh, under uh, international humanitarian law, the national law of the state, uh, uh, legally sovereign state, should be applied on this territory during the occupation. So uh, based on international law, Ukrainian law is applicable and uh, international humanitarian law uh, to the uh, people uh, on, uh, in, in Crimea and uh, on the entire territory of Crimea. But Russia is, the uh, Russian Federation is denying their status as uh, occupying power. They simply claim that they annexed Crimea and based on this they can apply their own law. So they co they're committing double violation of international law, uh, entering uh, uh, another state and uh, applying their law instead of national law. Mm -hmm. So uh, Crimeans are in unique situation. This is a precedent and uh, um, international law and international legal expert, they do not know how to deal with this situation because there is an obligation, but the state, uh, which used to be a guarantor of human rights, uh, isn't obeying the law. Mm -hmm. So the situation may change. Maybe international community will decide to create special court or Ukraine which will we advise in, in our yeah. recommendations them to do based on the Lebanon case. Maybe uh, Ukraine mm -hmm. will ratify um, a Rome, Rome statute. That will make a difference. Uh, maybe not at once, but at least uh, something will happen because uh, um, ICC will have a jurisdiction. They can send the investigators uh, to Ukraine if they decide to do. I believe so, they will. So uh, could, could you explain me a little bit more about this recommendation on, um, mm -hmm. um, on the possibility of creating a separate law? On no, the, not a separate law. A uh, separate court, sorry. Yes, mm -hmm. a separate co uh, court. We are talking actually uh, about cr uh, creating uh, by the UN giving the mandate uh, to create a uh, special court of special jurisdiction based on Ukrainian law with international judges and uh, remedying the uh, violation of human rights that happened uh, possibly during Maidan, uh, happening right now in Crimea and in the East. And we came into conclusion that that actually would be, uh, in the current situation, the perfect solution. Uh, given the resistance with respect to the Rome Statute, uh, and uh, the society needs to heal. The, uh, this is uh, also uh, one step forward to the rule of establishing the rule of law, and that that would be a great precedent. We belie believe to establish such court, where uh, again using the uh, Ukrainian laws and uh, by international judges, uh, those cases would be decided. Uh, both civil, administrative, and criminal cases. Uh, we have 60 um, recommendations. They are very practical. Uh, what Olen actually said, she uh, she man, she explained. It's a complicated procedure, but there are many different things that uh, individuals can do. Uh, they should do, and the state actually uh, many obligations that the state should do, as well as the international community. Why? Because uh, this is uh, unpre what happened is unprecedented. Uh, we basically what we witnessing is uh, the world, in, uh, uh, the international law and order that has been established after the World War II has been completely dismantled by the Russian Federation. Uh, so uh, the UN Charter, the Helsinki Act, the Budapest Memorandum, a bunch of uh, many uh, numerous agreements with the Russian Federation, to which Russian Federation is a signatory. Not only. Uh, um, this creates uh, an ugly precedent and very dangerous precedent, but it also uh, puts the whole international community in a legal vacuum. So such uh, solutions, uh, we, uh, we believe, would be quite beneficial. Also, we are talking about creating, as other tools, creating the uh, database for the Crimeans to store their data data, anonymously, not anonymously, uh, data about Say if they own a house, they can store data about the property rights to the house, uh, the deed, and everything else. If uh, they uh, actually make an application to the Russian Federation, uh, uh, de facto uh, um, 
authorities in Crimea and uh, they receive they don't receive or, or receive something they can also store the the, the application everything possible so th this this would be a huge uh, powerful tool which would not only empower citizens uh, of Ukraine but also would create uh, uh, send a huge signal to Russian Federation listen uh, uh, we are not using your methods but we are very strong we know what we are dealing with uh, we are going to your level but we are uh, we are going uh, to remedy the situation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, our recommendations they have uh, uh, we call the triangle uh, logic mm -hmm. and what does it mean uh, we give for example uh, the recommendation about the creation of that special for example uh, sp special uh, jurisdiction court and then we give similar uh, recommendation to the international society uh, society asking them to help Ukraine was creating such a court, right? And for the civil society to demand creation of such a court and stop all the nonsense with a hack and uh, kidding themselves. Uh, so why isn't it? It's not that uh, simple with Hague, and and less, let's say, less. Um, uh, the thing with Hague is that uh, uh, the opinion will be advisory because uh, uh, Russia has a power to uh, deny jurisdiction in those matters. That's why a hack is, uh, mm, it is a forum, it's a place to go, but they have no authority, no jurisdiction to provide any kind of uh, yeah, uh, effective, real, practical remedy. That happened before with the case of Georgia, that Georgia went to Hague and had the same response and R Russia didn't um, agree to participate and so they only statue, they issue um, Kind of advisory, opinion. advisory opinion. Which is that good as well. Right. It, it's good, good. It's good to have it's that. Good. But they should do it as well. The same things. They should do it. However, uh, uh, they should proceed uh, proceed with other uh, important uh, angles as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, they're doing something, but they are uh, really slow. And sometimes they are thinking more uh, about uh, geopolitics, not about. Uh, uh, local state uh, building, uh, like uh, just have, uh, whom are you talking in this case? Uh, Ukraine. About Ukrainian uh, mm -hmm. authorities, the Ukrainian government. And uh, there are a lot of declarations, but uh, not so uh, many actions. And we have a proof. I did an experiment uh, in uh, uh, in the law on occupied territories, on the, uh, the law which uh, is man, uh, which was meant to guarantee human rights on occupied territory. Uh, the uh, Ukraine claims that. It will bring to justice everybody who, uh, like Russia, is a, a, a Russian Federation, and its officers are responsible for any kind of violations committed there. But Ukraine will bring them to justice. And what I discovered that there is no way to report human rights violation to uh, Ukrainian law enforcement officers. I have a letter from uh, Minister of Justice, uh, which uh, says that. Ukraine isn't able to investi investigate any crimes or other uh, violations of the law on the territory of Crimea, and there is nowhere where, where can I report. Y uh, today we heard that they are trying to reconstruct the law enforcement bodies uh, for Crimea uh, in, in the territory of Kherson uh, Oblast, mm -hmm. but those are plans. And Do you think there is, uh, is there uh, legally a way for Ukraine to let's say, announced Russia as an um, occupying power in Donbass and making Russia res legally responsible for the human rights violation in Donbass. Would that work? Yes. And, and how, how that should be done? Yeah. Uh, here we have an overview of international humanitarian law and we have a definition of occupation and occupying power. And uh, if you apply that definition to the facts, uh, uh, to, to the reality uh, of Donbass, of Donbass mm -hmm. You have um, fulfilled the <laughs> definition, all uh, characteristics of uh, occupation, all criteria uh, are met. So where should Ukraine go with that? To, to some international bodies or uh, the same Ukrainian parliament could recognize it? We haven't done the research, so we, we are not feeling, uh, we, I, I don't feel comfortable to uh, make uh, uh, a conclusion at this point, but I believe that uh, the same recom similar recommendations or the same recommendations with respect to creating the special uh, the court of special jurisdiction uh, based on the case of Lebanon would be also applicable here as well as to Maidan human rights violation. Uh, the same idea of reporting the uh, the crimes that are happening again. Uh, it's a very complicated situation, 
and uh, things have to stop somewhere. And uh, honesty, very simple things, uh, uh, should be <laughs> uh, it should be done very mm -hmm. simply and just. To mm -hmm. answer your question, uh, whether there is a need for a declaration, formal declaration, like um, U.S. law and international law is more kind of common law and natural law. So uh, when the definition of uh, occupation is met, there is no need for any formal declaration. It's like uh, old thinking for civil law countries where everything is based on what is written in the law. So uh, mm -hmm. we don't have a war because war wasn't uh, declared. declared. It's not true. If, it's if you were attacked or uh, raped, you don't need to declare mm -hmm. that yeah. you were... Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so Russia occupied Ukraine. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, this is a fact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It just, yeah, it just, it just recognize you don't decorate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, s uh, somebody is uh, making a point why Ukraine is not uh, making any statement about uh, occupation of Donbass. Ukraine can do that, but there is no need uh, for any, uh, it's not a formal requirement for any further proceedings. It's not a formal uh, requirement for uh, demanding uh, from Russia uh, obeying the international right. humanitarian mm -hmm. law. And we're back in the studio of Romatskia with uh, news from Odessa. Governor Mikhail Saakashvili has presented a uh, new deputy of the governor, a uh, well-known Russian opposition politician activist Maria Gaidar. Uh, Maria, who has been working with Boris Nemtsov, Alexei Navalny, has also closely experienced working in Russian state system. In 2009-2011, she's been working as a deputy governor of Kirov Oblast. Maria comes from a family of reformers. She's a daughter of uh, Igor. Gaidar, well-known Russian economist, politician, the author of Russian early economic reforms known as shock therapy, um, right after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So Maria, we, we're having Maria right now in our studio. Maria, thank you so much for joining us tonight. So, um, thank you. Good evening. Is it, is, it, is it official? What's your status right now? Yeah, we're just discussing this. Uh, I am a nominee. Uh, there is some procedure have to be confer confirmed by the president. So uh, we're waiting for that. And you, do you also need to receive Ukrainian citizenship? Yes, yes, yes. that's also procedure. It's, it's, it doesn't have to last for long, to take a long time, but uh, it will take some time. And I yeah. mean, to ask yeah. maybe one of the difficult questions off the back, I mean, under Ukrainian citizenship law, you're only allowed to have a single citizenship. So are you prepared to give up your Russian citizenship, or have you thought about how that would work? I'll, I'll ask, I'll go and, uh, and ask if uh, what they say, the officials, I'll do. But uh, I, um, I know that according to the law, it's like two years of transition period where you can... Uh, so you'd you know, wait and yeah. see. But I mean, for some Ukrainians, they might, I mean, they might be concerned that see, you know, a Russian who's coming in for a position and hear that sort of answer to question, I'll wait and see whether or not I'm going to stay, whether or not I'll take the citizenship. I mean, what's, what's your investment in Ukraine right now? What's, play, paint no, the I'm, path. I'm, a huge investment. It's the project of my life now, but mm -hmm. uh, um, and I'll do I'll do what is required. But mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, uh, I have uh, Russia family. I have property. I have uh, different uh, circumstances, which also are. Uh, go with, together with citizenship. Well, and paint a picture for us, because our, our audience is mainly international. How does it happen that an opposition figure in Russia, you know, becomes an official or is in the process of becoming an official in Ukraine, in Odessa? How did this come to be? I don't, I don't think any problem. If you uh, followed the job of Mikhail Saakashvili, uh, he had uh, people with different uh, backgrounds and different citizenship in his government. So what he's trying to create is an efficient team, and he has um, national ethnicity, whatever religion, doesn't matter. Effect effectiveness is the only factor. So um, at the same time, I never said that uh, the regime, I always was in opposition, even when I was the only one to be in the opposition uh, in Russia since uh, 2005. Uh, and uh, I uh, worked and always had the, uh, always, uh, always was focused on social, uh, social issues. And uh, there is a huge, huge problem in Odessa. There are uh, 
internally displaced people, a lot of them, and uh, unfortunately not enough has been done yet, so, so yeah, there is yeah, need we'll, to we'll fix this, to yeah, mm -hmm. this we'll problem quite, uh, quite fast and effectively. Yeah, we'll get to Odessa, but the, the, the interesting question right now is that uh, from what you're saying, uh, you don't want to break any links with Russia and probably you're, you're planning on getting back there, but from the reaction even from Russia right now, your appointment or your nomination is pretty harsh. Uh, how do you see that? I mean, how do you see your future here in Ukraine and after your work here, probably in Russia? Uh, Russia is going to change. Russia now is not a democracy. And so one day Russia is definitely going to become a democracy and it's going to be a completely different situation. Uh, completely. Probably we're going to have Ukrainians going to work to Russia and we're going to have the same discussions uh, uh, like now over there, which I hope. Uh, I always wanted uh, Russian government to be formed on the uh, basis of meritocracy, not on the basis of political loyalty to a very specific uh, uh, specific clan that is now at power. But uh, um, I, uh, I think that everything depends on uh, what I'm going to be able to achieve. Well, and that's I, a question off of that. You know, with a lot of these foreigners coming to Russia, there have been a lot of, you know, more liberal Russians, opposition Russians who've moved to Ukraine. Not as many working for the government, but some. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious what Ukraine is for you, because I've seen some of your other interviews where you spoke about this brotherhood between mm -hmm. Ukrainian and mm -hmm. Russian people. Mm -hmm. But to many of our viewers, I mean, that's something that's really been poisoned by yeah. Putin propaganda. That means Russia leading the way. That means Ukrainians yeah, yeah. being subjected. Understand. I was talking to Russian audience, and I was saying that this is hypocritical critical to say to, to speak so much about the brotherhood because in Russia people speak a lot about the brotherhood and criticize so harsh a person who want to, wants to work in Ukraine uh, at the same time I uh, don't think there is uh, uh, I don't think we have to talk about brotherhood you know first of all uh, Russia needs to end the war then we have to become neighbors after that good neighbors then partners, and then probably members of European Union together. That's bring us to the, our question from one of our, um, sorry, from one of our viewers. Uh, I don't have it right now here, but the question is, uh, is there a war? Yes, definitely there is a war. The journalist said, I just didn't, I have to, had to go, and I told her that I have to go. Definitely there is a war. And, and who is the war with? Because this was the war big yeah, just to make yeah, there is a war, and uh, there is a war with Russia. This, this is a fact. This is absolutely clear. There is no doubt for me whatsoever. And uh, uh, I just, uh, I, I, I mean, that, that, that's absolutely clear for me. And uh, that was uh, uh, this, and uh, many, in, not in many probably, but in interviews in Russia, I, uh, I shared my position. I told that this is war is illegal, it's immoral, uh, that uh, Russia was an aggressor, and I never changed this position. And I mean, f just for our viewers to explain why we're asking this, this was a big topic in Ukrainian media over the weekend. You know, they showed a brief clip where you were with you, or I guess where you were walking no, away. But, uh, there's a, there was a journalist, and she she was following me, and she 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 did some questions and answered to some questions. And then I had to go, and she continued, uh, continued to repeat, uh, repeat the question. I said, "Sorry, I have to go," and she continued to repeat. And then she just yeah, it left, like you, you left them. It, it looks like I don't want to respond to this question, yeah, but it it's did. not, it's it not the case. I uh, do want, and I'm ready to respond to this question. And I don't think that there is even a need to respond to this, uh, uh, to this question because this is a factual thing. You know, for me, this is a factual thing. There is no mm -hmm. question about that. Probably there is question about that for people who are brainwashed by Russian propaganda, but there is uh, a fact for me. And I think it, this should be a fact for anyone who has eyes, who has, uh, uh, who has eyes, who has uh, the, the way to analyze uh, information and the way to find uh, uh, information from different sources, not just mm -hmm. from Russian state uh, TV, Russian state propaganda. Well, you're getting back to Ukraine, to your work uh, in, in Odessa. In your opinion, where Ukraine is, is headed as a country, as a nation, uh, where its place in the world? How do you see In European it? Union, definitely. I want Ukraine to be in European Union. I want uh, Ukraine to be an independent, uh, uh, prosperous, uh, open, democratic country. I think there is a long way to go. And, uh, but I think this is very important for Ukraine and it's going to uh, have a great impact on the region as a whole and even on Russia. But the most important thing for Ukraine is to succeed on this way, to show that this way is possible. Uh, it's, uh, it's going to be a very huge mental change for a lot of people in the region if uh, uh, Ukraine do this. Success, they can show uh, that it's possible. Can show that's possible. And if we look at, you know, specifically you and we look at, at Odessa, what would your priorities be? I mean, do you know what you would focus on or uh, what you would want yes, to? Yes, it's, uh, it's a social branch. 
uh, mm -hmm. all, all like whole uh, bunch of uh, social issues. The press, uh, the most pressing is the internal displaced people. It's uh, more than a thousand people with disabilities. Uh, uh, they were received, but temporary, you know, they're staying without any uh, clear vision of their future, you know, how they're going to live, where, uh, how mm -hmm. the uh, uh, state is going to help them. So it's very pressing, it's very urgent, and uh, this, uh, this issue should be addressed, and I want to address uh, this issue. And uh, there's a whole, whole, huge, uh, huge... Um, huge amount of problems, not uh, uh, in healthcare, uh, education, the whole system. But uh, first of all, it's uh, uh, internal displaced people and uh, uh, putting up the system to, mm -hmm. uh, to work effectively mm -hmm. as an administration to uh, fight corruption mm -hmm. and to bring transparency and to bring uh, all the possible international help and the help of NGO and to make this help and their work effective. Well, so what can be done with IDPs that can that isn't being done now? We're going to, no, a lot of people are just uh, placed uh, in some temporary in uh, sanatorius. Uh, it's like uh, something like hotel and healthcare facilities. Uh, they're, they're placed there, it's temporary. Uh, they. Uh, some of them receive some compensation for uh, for food. Some of them not. Mm. Some of them are people with disabilities. They need special uh, special care. So these people need a place to live. You know, mm -hmm. these people need uh, somebody to take care of people who are di uh, with disabilities, and they need uh, we need to help people uh, who want to find a job. Mm -hmm. You know, and want to work. Mm -hmm. So there should be a clear vision. You know what to do. Now there is no clear vision. You know, there are promises that are made were made by politicians mm -hmm. many many times, but it was just you know just to put aside the problem, you know, to within silence the it for, uh, for a while. the government, you mean, aware there is no yeah, there, yeah, and it is, uh, for, 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 for a year, people were just placed in these temporary sanatoriums, and the temporary became constant, uh, and people are very tired, they're very depressed, they're very, very, uh, they're, they're, they're feeling inside as, uh, um, they feel that they're uh, left, you know, yes, left alone yes. with their problems, so yes. we need to talk honestly with these people, you know, we need to work family, from family to family, trying to find solutions, you know, trying to find a place for them to live, mm -hmm. uh, trying to find a place for the children to go to a kindergarten, you know, trying to find a job and help with the job to people who want yeah, all, and can all work. All the sorts of things. All the, we, there we, is we, a we lot of need, international yes. help and a lot of Indian people who want to work, but without clear plan, without clear vision, you know, all this help, it goes like it's very fragmented, mm -hmm. you know, somebody helps to someone, but there is no Well, clear. that's the coordination which would bring Yeah, no taking... coordination and also no, mm -hmm. probably we need to, like, to ask for international support, you know, to, yeah, uh, to make much bigger resources to, to have a clear plan, to ask but for support. But if we take a step back, it. I mean, mm -hmm. there's some people, and I have to bring in the international dimension again because it is something we're focused on, some people are saying, you know, you being considered or brought in is another provocation to Putin with this. They said the same thing about Saakashvili. No, How would you so. respond to I, that? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, can, I cannot judge why this impression, but I... Uh, uh, by the days I was there, you know, Saakashvili is just talking corruption, 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 Odessa, 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 corruption, 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 and I, I never hear about Putin from him. I, uh, people say that, you know, there is this mental thing uh, with Saakashvili, Putin, but in, in the work, in the team, we don't talk about that. It's like a lot of, uh, a lot of things discussed, uh, you know, But how was the plans. proposal made, actually? How was the proposal made, and why did you decide to take it, after all? I decided to take because I wanted to, to do the right thing, you know, I wanted to be in line with my values and I wanted to do something that uh, could matter and something that could, uh, uh, well, from my personal, also from my personal perspective, to, to, to fix the wrong that was done. Uh, to, to Ukrainian people, that's one thing. And also I'm a uh, technocrat, I'm an expert, you know, I know that I can be effecti effective working in, uh, uh, with these issues, addressing these issues, and I want to work in an effective team that is really, uh, is really determined to fight corruption, to bring mm -hmm. change, to move to Europe, to, uh, to bring European values. And uh, uh, for me, that's, uh, that's like a fresh air, you know, like a big, mm -hmm. uh, a big chance, because when you're trapped in this mentality, when you're trapped in this, uh, 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 absence of hope, you know, mm. uh, it's, it's, it's just uh, a way also to, to break, you know, to break this uh, What's the breakthrough and make it possible? But I mean, that's my question. What is Ukraine to you? Because it sounds like a big part of Ukraine is showing that certain things are possible to make that then possible in Russia. Is that correct? I, yes. And also and I not started only to my, Russia. I also I started my political career after the first Maidan. Mm -hmm. and, it had a, uh, and it had a great uh, impression on me. 
uh, first of all, because I understood what is the regime about after that, so, you know, because uh, after that the propaganda started and everything started, you know, it was in Russia. Mm -hmm. And also I was Razum uh, uh, Nas it was a great, uh, great mm -hmm. impression. So it was all, 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 always uh, Ukraine for many Russians, you know, it was always some, we were sorry when things went wrong here, you know, we were like very sorry when we saw Yanukovych and everything that was going on because we were also always watching Ukraine and hoping Ukraine to succeed because we hope that if Ukraine can succeed, we can also succeed. You but know, there's probably something change. different in, on, on your agenda and um, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, in what you do in Ukraine and what you wanted to do in Russia. In, to what extent is it different? Uh, I want Russia to be a democratic country. It's, it's uh, 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 you know, we uh, at this at this point, you know, first of all, the war should be stopped. The first thing in Russia. Mm -hmm. Uh, second thing, uh, democracy should come. You know, without democracy, with so this regime, elections, elections uh, uh, free media, because this propaganda is really killing. It's killing outside the country, it's killing inside the country. The story of Boris Nemtsov is uh, it's also a very personal uh, and tragic thing for me. You know, Boris Nemtsov, he worked. Uh, uh, here, he worked here, you know, and there are uh, people who uh, it, it, now in some state commission that say that they they cannot uh, uh, do a memorial for him in Russia, you know, there's a street under the name of Boris Nemtsov here, but they cannot do a memorial for Boris Nemtsov because uh, they say he did nothing, when they say very stupid things, like, you know, if, uh, and if somebody wants to get uh, famous and get a memorial, probably he can, you know, provoke somebody to, to kill him. And stupid things, you know, and they criticize him and they say he's Whatever. So it, it's also something very, uh, mm. it's very traumatic for me and important for me. Marie, another question which is probably asked any Russian would be asked in, in, in Ukraine mm -hmm. about Crimea, mm -hmm. which is uh, mm -hmm. Crimea is Russian or Ukrainian? Your Ukrainian. Uh, Crimea is definitely Ukrainian uh, at this moment. Uh, uh, we, but we have to understand, you know, we have to, uh, we have to understand the factual situation on the ground. You know, the factual situation on the ground uh, is, uh, is how it is, you know, you, it's not under Ukrainian control at this moment, you know, it's under the control of Russia. And uh, there are people there, they're also all, also brainwashed by the propaganda, you know, they're also, they're, they had a referendum, you know, some, some people, uh, you know, referendum under the guns, you know, some people had to flee. But I, I don't, I don't, um, I understand, for me it's absolutely clear, you know, Crimea was annexed, Crimea was part of Ukraine, we signed this agreement, you know, and what happened was both illegal and immoral. Uh, how to fix it? Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's a very difficult, uh, I mean, technically, I don't know how to fix it and when it's going to be fixed, but uh, certainly Ukraine, uh, Crimea should be returned to... Uh, Something should be done. Yeah. And to turn in a slightly different direction, I mean, um, when we talk about Ukraine, sometimes looking at Ukraine is reminiscent of Russia of the 90s with economic instability, mm -hmm. with, you know, a certain dependency on international organizations for loans mm -hmm. and financing. You know, with your father having been a key prime minister mm -hmm. in the 90s, what, what are, are there lessons or things he spoke about that you take with you? He, you he see wrote a applicable? wonderful book, uh, Post-Imperial uh, uh, post Syndrome. And he, he wrote a book that is very, very dangerous for a country, for all the empires that were, uh, that um, uh, broke, uh, broke apart empires with colonies or empires with uh, that territorially integrated. And he talked about this, that this is the mm -hmm. very, very, uh, a big, big uh, danger. Like what happened in Serbia, you know, mm -hmm. and what's uh, going on in Russia is just the worst scenario that he pictured and he explained it and he explained it on historical level with historical examples, he explained it on, uh, with the factual data of economics, uh, and uh, he uh, uh, he foresaw it. You know, he foresaw this as a risk, and unfortunately, this actually this risk, this awful scenario, is playing out now. And uh, I mean, mm -hmm. thank you so much. Thank you, Maria, for joining us. So, uh, Maria Gaidar, uh, a nominee for the deputy um, governor of Odessa region, will be following Maria's activities and hopefully talk to Maria once again. Uh, and next, we'll have another section more or less connected to, to Russia again. Yeah, well, we can't, <laughs> we never quite get away from Russia. It's relevant to everything. Um, but our next guest is a veteran correspondent who had also worked as an anchor for RT before resigning on air during the Russian annexation of Crimea over a year ago. Uh, she also testified in front of the American House, so the Committee on Foreign Relations, in a special hearing talking about how to fight Russian propaganda. But first, we want to play a video for you of her on-air resignation from RT. 
Last night, RT made international headlines when one of our anchors went on the record and said Russian intervention in Crimea is wrong. And indeed, as a reporter on this network, I face many ethical and moral challenges, especially me personally, coming from a family whose grandparents, my grandparents, came here as refugees during the Hungarian Revolution, ironically, to escape the Soviet forces. I have family on the opposite side, on my mother's side, uh, that sees the daily grind of poverty. And I'm very lucky to have grown up here in the United States. Uh, I'm the daughter of a veteran. My partner is a physician at a military base where he sees every day the firsthand accounts of the ultimate prices that people pay for this country. And that is why, personally, I cannot be part of network funded by the Russian government that whitewashes the actions of Putin. I'm proud to be an American and believe in disseminating the truth. And that is why, after this newscast, I'm resigning. So joining us now in the studio is Liz Vol. Thank you so much for being here. Nice to be here. It's over a year. What is it like watching this video for you now? Huh, um, <laughs> I try not to watch it because it brings back memories of, of that chaotic time. But um, I don't have any regrets watching it all this time, especially uh, having witnessed or you know having seen the way things have played out on the ground in Ukraine. I can, I think we can all pretty much confidently say that Russian media has indeed been instrumental in manipulating the information space when it comes to Ukraine. So um, I'm glad that I took action at the time that I did and hopefully brought attention to the issue um, in one form or another and, and get people kind of interested and uh, I guess aware of the role that Russia plays in today's news and geopolitical Well, and you've climate. had an interesting arc, because, I mean, in your statement with what you were saying, it had personal elements with your Hungarian heritage and yes. discussing that. But since then, I mean, you've gone on to become, uh, you know, an expert, someone who speaks more generally about what this new style of Russian propaganda is and speaking in front of Congress. Um, but, I mean, I was curious, since we're dealing with this one-year anniversary of the shooting down of MH17, mm. I mean, what is your take on how RT or other Russian media, how have they covered that? What sort of uh, a narrative have they tried to present? Right. Well, I think that the way that the Russian media is covering even the one-year anniversary is just consistent with the way that they, they cover news in general, especially when it comes to Ukraine. Uh, I remember at the time when the plane was shot down, uh, immediately I, I, was, I was thinking, oh, I wonder, I wonder how they're going to spin this, you know, and it didn't take too long for several competing theories to come out of Russian media, some of them being really far-fetched, um, you know, that it was the first missing Malaysian Airlines already carrying mm -hmm. dead bodies. I mean, that, that's the extreme end of conspiracy. Um, but the, the one that, that was uh, got a lot of play right away was that it was uh, targeting a plane that President Putin was flying on, and, um, and, and the one I think that they were tried to make the most plausible was that they were, uh, it was actually the Ukrainians that were responsible. So again, goes back to the strategy, blame Ukraine, always blame the Ukrainians when it comes to covering the war in Ukraine. And I mean, when you, when you would work for RT, you know, it, they do seem to kind of change their position on different issues at times. Mm -hmm. I mean, as someone who worked there, how would that happen? Would there be different guidelines or just suddenly something new would come right. down? Well, uh, as, as, the, as the evidence comes out that is not favorable to the Kremlin, uh, then, then you have to change your narrative, okay? If you say mm -hmm. that uh, there's no little green men on the ground, they don't exist, they're not there, well, if news reports come out that that's not the case, we have video evidence, we have eyewitness accounts, we have, you know, whatever, documents, whatever, there, there's proof, well, then you have to shift your position and say, oh, well, they're peacekeeping forces, you know? And then it's kind of going with, uh, and you're right, it's bizarre. And it's not necessarily that they're trying to convince the audience of a particular position all the time, but simply, I think, uh, seeing it firsthand and following it, it's more of just trying to stir confusion. 
so that people don't really know what's going on. You yeah, know? but don't you, don't you think that it's a part of the, tra uh, of the strategy? What we see with the MH17, new versions coming up. Mm -hmm. So as much information as possible, as many information as possible, mm -hmm. as many versions as possible. Don't you think that is exactly part of, of the strategy to, mm -hmm. to, to feel, you know, confused and to, to, to feel that the, the situation is too complicated, you know, right. to understand something? Exactly the strategy, and I think it's an effective strategy, because um, again, and and you got to think, and, and they know the way. Especially, mm -hmm. it's relevant in today's media climate because news, you know, we're on Twitter. Um, I mean, you know, working in journalism, and everybody's, you know, it's by the minute, by the second. Mm -hmm. But if they put out competing theories right away, it takes a while for Western journalists that that want to find out the facts to actually come to actually debunk it. And so they're going to put out that narrative right away and by the time that it's debunked, it's already that initial impression and first impressions matter and I think Russian media knows that. And so um, and so I think that and I'm seeing it because I've done some traveling throughout Europe, Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. the Baltic states, and, and you really feel this frustration and exasperation with how do you deal yeah, with yeah. this Yeah, yeah, this is exactly what, what, what the most interesting part. How, how, do, what's the influence? How does it work? And whether people do really are, uh, whether they are caught into this, you know, um, into this vicious circle of information circling around. How mm -hmm. does it work in the United States? How, how, you know, um, whether people are really watching, believing, and following. Right. Okay. And this is where it gets strange or kind of complicated because people ask, well, who actually believes in these crazy alternative theories that Russia puts out, that Russian media puts out? You know, they, they give a platform to 9-11 truthers, um, mm. some other far-fetched conspiracy theories. And... Um, and I, I came to realize, and from my story and my experience in actually being a target of, of Russian media, the way that it does work. For example, when I had resigned, there were theories that they put out about me, about who I am, that I was a CIA agent, mm -hmm. that it was, you know, all a self-promotional stunt. And one that really stuck was that I was uh, a neocon, part of this greater conspiracy theory, a, a greater conspiracy to ignite another Cold War. And this one really stuck, and it hmm. was tweeted over and over again by RT correspondents, and this this following that they have that really uh, that and they use these words, you know, if you are against the Russian narrative, you're either a neo-Nazi or a neocon. They so, they, <laughs> so they use these kinds of words to brand you, and is it effective? Well, yes, because I'm spammed by the Russian trolls and the sympathizers that maybe aren't the paid trolls and being like, oh, you know, you, you're, you're a fraud. I mean, some expletive words that I can't say right here on, you know, on the air. <laughs> and, and, and it works and, the, and it mobilizes them. And so, you know, it becomes well, wanna, a controversy wanna, yeah. and it becomes, there's a narrative out there about even me, and I'm using this as just, because I mm -hmm. feel like it's a microcosm of the way that it works, mm -hmm. is that, you know, and then my Wikipedia page was all this one source. It was controlled. And it takes a while. It took a few weeks for it to correct itself. Well, which but is the same thing you're talking about. That then that first version has come out and people believe that believe even it. it's and corrected later. And then all later. of a sudden it's like, well, uh, maybe she was controlled by a neocon organization. Maybe she was, you know, maybe well, which who is, knows. Who which knows? is what I want to bring yeah. it knows. back to. Because which is with Ukraine. Yeah. Who knows who's responsible? Yeah. Who knows who fired those shots? It's, it's mm -hmm. always competing, competing theories. And uh, I just want to quote you because you, sure. you said it really well. I mean, what you're talking about is uh, other people have spoken about it too, the wrecking of the information space. And I just wanted to quote part of what you had said to Congress. Um, we'll, we'll play a brief video of you, but I'll read it here. It says, the Russian bosses say that the organization is simply providing another perspective, one that is ignored in Western media. The implication there is that there is no such thing as objective truth. But let us not get duped falsehood, someone is responsible for pulling the trigger that killed Russian opposition leader Boris Nemtsov. Someone is responsible for launching the Buk missile that downed MH17, killing all 298 passengers on board. And what I found so powerful about that is if you make it all relative, mm -hmm. you lose any accountability or any, any sort of real pain or yes. suffering. Yes, and that's definitely a strategy that is used by Russian media. The editor-in-chief of Margarita Simonyan had said herself that there is no such thing as an objective truth and um, and and I think on the surface it sounds like a really enlightened position that oh you know there's a perspective um, there, everything is just a matter of perspective 
Uh, but Which it, sounds good. It sounds really good. <laughs> you know, you have a viewpoint, you have a viewpoint, but then it gets it gets a little strange and it gets a little funky when you put crazy people on that have no interest in the truth, and then you say that their viewpoint is just as relevant as, as somebody else that is really interested in seeking the truth. And yeah, it manipulates this idea of, of, of moral relativism, and, uh, and it really um, manipulates that. And the way that Western media works, you know, we, we try, there's, there's standards in, in the newsroom, you know, mm. to try to uh, credit your sources, fact check, stuff like that. Whereas in Russian media, it's those kinds of checks and balances aren't there. So it's more enforce the narrative, enforce the narrative. How do you do that? Well, you know, we'll ignore certain things, we'll deny certain things. And then if it gets twisted enough, I mean, lie. So it takes, takes time for someone in the newsroom to understand, to understand. what is happening, happening really, because you were not uh, obviously uh, the only one who, who is well, uh, that leads mm. us to, to, to a question uh, maybe a little bit about HR strategy. Mm -hmm. Who is really working there? Mm -hmm. who, is, who is seeking job at RT right. and who is believing in that job and, you know, working right. principally? Right. So uh, I would say there was, uh, it's a spectrum. Um, I, I worked at RT America, so the, the bureau was in Washington, D.C. So a majority, interestingly, of the employees are Amer were, mm -hmm. were American there. Um, they have, you know, other bureaus in, in London and, and elsewhere, mm -hmm. so Western journalists. And um, when it comes to reporters, the, the, you know, for the newscast, they want, you know, this to have some kind of basis in truth. So that's the thing. You can make a lot of news stories, and I, I, did, I did a bunch that I thought were worthwhile. You can, you well, can do stories that make the West look bad and have it yes. be 100% true, because we do have our own problems. Uh, and so especially <laughs> Occupy Wall Street. I mean, from being from New York and my friends who are in New York, at the time there was a lot of positive you know, feedback, the fact that you and others, that they were giving press coverage to something that wasn't being covered elsewhere. Yes. And that cover colored a lot of people's reception of RT later on. Um, yeah, but they we're happy to see RT. I remember we covered it for quite, you know, very in depth for a long time. And when we arrived with our green microphone, they mm. were we were welcomed. <laughs> they were they were glad to see us because they knew that we were, you know, that we would cover them fairly. Um, but I mean, coming back to this, what what is the ethical issue? Because I know I don't know as much about the DC bureau. There are articles written about the journalists that were sought for the Moscow bureau, often from the UK, fresh out of their degree program, yes. not speaking Russian, no experience there. Basically, people they could take advantage no, of. No. So by the time that you know they realized what was going on, they'd already had them for a while, and they could replace them with new people. But what are the ethical questions for journalists? I mean, how in a difficult market with not a lot of jobs, how do people deal with that? Right. You know. Um, and I think I think they're going to have an increasingly difficult time recruiting Western journalists. I, I, I would think with a lot of the fallout that had happened as a result of the coverage of, of Ukraine and um, I guess resignations some yeah. that have uh, <laughs> exposed it to some extent. Um, another thing, that, yes, that's true. And so you know, if some of the journalists are fresh and they they, they want to impress their bosses, well then you have this. Some instances where the journalist can be molded, you know, and if you don't ask the right, if you ask the, if you don't ask the right questions, rather, well, then you're gonna kind of be kind of the soft power. You're gonna be you're gonna be punished. You're you're not gonna be put on stories. You're not gonna you're not gonna get a raise. You know, things like that. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna you're gonna it's it's it, life is gonna be difficult for you. However, if you push the line, if you don't push, you know, the the, the wrong buttons, if you really play to that Kremlin narrative. Then you're you going to advance ahead. very quickly. So if you are okay with that, it, life is going to be pretty good there. Um, so there's that kind of camp, and there's that way that it happens. So as a result, there's this strong level of self-censorship that happens. You know, in the morning meeting, just to not pitch that story and not ask that question. Otherwise, it's going to be a really long, awkward silence, and the Russian bosses are not going to be happy. And you're that much farther away from the raise right, or the trip right. or whatever it is. And then, but and then, but mm. then uh, another th way that they um, are able to get journalists or commentators is, is actually um, actively recruiting people that come from a fringe background or a mm -hmm. conspiratorial background. So, you know, there's people that um, tend to be very uh, conspiratorial and, you know, one of the hosts that they hired was a very staunch 9-11 uh, truther and she comes from this kind of background, I don't want to implicate anybody specifically, um, that, that would kind of, that has that way of thinking that the West is corrupt, that, uh, you know, that the U.S. is, is you know, just 
trying to take over the world. And it sounds, it sounds crazy. Sounds like an attractive idea. Exactly. But there's people that believe in that and they're Mm. given a platform and well, yes, disproportionately. That, that are given a platform. But to change, I mean, the, that'll be the last question for me, but an interesting one. I mean, since you've moved into this role of explaining it and trying to explain this, you know, propaganda war, whatever people want to want to call it, what has the reception been? I mean, how have people received you? And, you know, I feel like maybe I'm being a little biased, but maybe some of the people you're explaining it to are older politicians, older <laughs> executives who don't have the best grasp of internet or some of the media. Right. You know, I think when this had first happened, when when I had resigned, there wasn't really um, an understanding uh, as to how effective and how manipulative and uh, media can can be used to, to manipulate a war in this in this situation of conflict. Um, but I'm seeing as time went on that there was increasing interest. You know, we heard one of the top leaders of NATO saying this is one of the greatest information blitzes that we've seen ever, um, and leaders, you know, in the Baltic states and elsewhere, Eastern Europe, really acknowledging the effectiveness of, of this kind of propaganda. And of course, uh, in our, in Congress, in U.S. Congress, we, we just by that, that uh, hearing mm-hmm. before the House Committee on Foreign Affairs, show that there is now this interest and response and this, um, at least this feeling that we need to do something to counter it, you know, to take it seriously. So I'm seeing that as the conflict had played out, that there's political military journalists all over the world, specifically Eastern Europe, Central Europe, the surrounding regions that are um, affected by the conflict, um, Mm -hmm. more or less sanctions or or, uh, possibility of of it spreading elsewhere, and of course the more muscle flexing from Russia. So you're seeing a growing interest in it and and, um, a desire to do something about it so that hopefully we can amplify the way. truth and so that these this menacing you know disinformation that's coming out from from the outlets and this troll to war and it. all of this uh, that we can fight it well i think we'll have to <laughs> have to end it there but thank you so much for coming on and talking to us about it it's uh, very thank interesting great, to get different to sides all right and now we'll move in a slightly different direction um so a little bit earlier, I spoke to Nirma Zelacic of the Commission for International Justice and Accountability, and we sat down and spoke about war crimes, specifically trying to prosecute them. She had a lot of expertise in war crimes from the former Yugoslavia, how they were received at the tribunal in The Hague, um, and just what people can expect. Let's take a look at that now. All right, Nirmal, thank you so much for joining us. My first question is, what is the hardest part about prosecuting war crimes? Well, thank you for having me here. The, what is the hard, hardest part, uh, part is uh, finding the evidence to hold leaders accountable. Um, bringing war criminals to justice if they are direct perpetrators of the crimes, if they have the blood on their hands, if they were involved in the crime scene itself is a relatively straightforward procedure. But uh, linking the crimes that happen uh, hundreds, sometimes thousands of kilometers away from where the political and military center and power is, is a completely different matter. It's a much more complex, uh, much more uh, paper-heavy procedure than uh, you would imagine. So number one, putting the case together against uh, either political or military leadership is uh, requires very very hard work especially if more than uh, one state is involved it's a, if it's an international conflict so how do you prove it because many ukrainians when they're looking at what's happening now I mean, they're not so much interested in the people who are primarily involved who are at the scene who are committed mm-hmm. but really connecting it to the russian state or to mm-hmm. putin and all of that what does that take i mean was which must have been implicated in some of those events because mm-hmm. he was taken to the icc mm-hmm. so what does it take to get those people well, it's a, it's a great uh, example. You mentioned uh, the president of uh, former Yugoslavia or Serbia, Slobodan Milosevic, who was brought on trial for, cases, uh, for wars in Bosnia and Croatia. The difference is, during the wars, you had the media reporting from all the conflicts. And uh, similar to here, everyone was saying, everyone knows 
Serbia is involved. Everyone knows Serbian military or paramilitary or weapons are involved, and Milosevic is president, and therefore he's guilty. But the court doesn't but work that way. And the court doesn't work that knows. way. So even though the, in, a, in the media, be it national or international, he was seen and even publicly held responsible for what was happening, in a court of law, it required much more. It required obtaining access to uh, Serbian uh, state and military archives obtaining access to intercepted conversations, uh, insider witnesses, people who were working uh, with Milosevic and defected either from the political party or the military structures. But that is a very, very hard work. How did they get that? Is that because of the changing political environment that then the leadership in Serbia wanted to support that? Uh, unfortunately, with the uh, Yugoslav example, that was the case. Uh, the Hague uh, Tribunal had to wait for the change of uh, regime in order to start getting their hands on the material documentation, the paperwork, the, the if you will, the bureaucracy of the war. And that is the thing that links you to mm. the political leadership, the administrative financial support that comes from one city in one state to the rebel groups, for example, in another state. So only when they state. had official support were they able to? And it was only then. And, and okay. uh, it's the lesson learned and carried away from uh, former Yugoslavia that uh, we are trying to implement now in Syria with the organization uh, I work for now. And that is to try and secure this documentation now. Because when the peace agreement was uh, signed and when the wars in former Yugoslavia stopped, even when the regime change happened, Mm. It was not always in the interest of the government to release the archives and to prove the state's involvement in the war because you don't want to take the responsibility even for the previous regime's conduct. So it took many years of the political pressure and uh, um, of the investigators on to the government to get, gain access. Mm. So what we're doing in Syria now is getting to that documentation now while the conflict is lasting. I mean, it's a more dangerous and very mm. risky work, but it is possible and saving it so you cannot be blackmailed uh, or cannot be hidden, it cannot be uh, tampered with, and you don't have to spend 15 years looking for mm. it after the war finishes. Well, and this is what I think is so interesting that the process has to be ongoing. Even while the conflict is still going on, it has to be collected. But I want to, uh, no, maybe not do an exercise with you where I'll name a type of ed evidence and you tell me if that's a war crime or how, mm -hmm. how that could come down. So, for example, if we have YouTube footage of a civilian area where there are apartment blocks being hit by shells and we're, it's clear who the military group is, mm -hmm. would that be a war crime? Well, it's not, uh, it's, uh, not so simple. Uh, as that it depends what the civilian area, whether the civilian area was a purely civilian area or whether it was used by the opposing military group or armed forces as a base from which attacks were launched on the other side. So there are uh, a number of questions you have to ask yourselves before concluding that it is a war crime. Um, the, it is about the proportionality of the attack. It is uh, um, whether these questions were asked by the attacking party before they shelled that civilian area. Is the proportionality of the harm that could be caused uh, reasonable and acceptable in a, that particular case? And that's what I find so interesting because many people would say that an area was hit, that's a war crime. But if uh, you know fighters were using that as a basis, if they were firing from there, then that already draws that into question. That it draws it, it into question, and you would have to litigate it uh, much more. It's Carefully. not uh, if it was a purely civilian area, if, uh, or if it were if there were uh, there are buildings that are they have that have specific uh, uh, protection, so such as hospitals, for example, or religious objects, etc. Uh, there are different questions that mm. you ask. But if a civilian building full of apartments is being used by snipers or uh, artillery of some uh, uh, opposing group, then you have to ask the question was military 
uh, target. Mm. No, and then I'm going to give you another example. I know mm -hmm. these are hard, but this is just to show the complication of it. If, you know, in Ukraine they had these gentlemen who were, um, said they were Russian soldiers who were captured by the Ukrainians. They released, the Ukrainian government released videos where they admitted that they were Russian soldiers, that they were sent there by the Russian government and so on. Is that video something you could use in a war crimes proceeding as evidence? I, would, I could imagine uh, the questions that a good defense lawyer would ask uh, uh, when you play that, and even a judge would ask when playing that uh, in a court of law, and that is how was the confession obtained? Was the confession of the captured soldiers ob obtained under any kind of duress? Not necessarily that you have to have visible signs of torture, you know, black eye or the bleeding while you're saying, yes, I'm a Russian soldier and I was sent here from Moscow. Uh, was there any type of duress present while these uh, three individuals made their statement? And then again, even if, if that was the only piece of evidence, I would not imagine that it would be enough to uh, uh, make the complete connection between uh, the official structures and these uh, individuals on the ground because mm. uh, you would have to prove that these, these three individuals were they involved in the criminal, uh, uh, criminal activity at the same time. Uh, just carrying a weapon by itself is not a war crime or being a part of an armed group in itself is not a war crime, but being uh, a part of an armed group, and armed group and carrying out criminal activity, be it killing or torturing or looting or uh, destroying is. So you have to link all of these uh, things up to the leadership and the city or the country you're trying to uh, To get the involve. people that's yeah. up and connected. Mm -hmm. All right, third and final example of that mm -hmm. type. Uh, people paid a lot of attention because there is a documentary that came out on Russian television where Putin said, taking Crimea, that was us, we planned it, that was our military services. Would a video like that made for you know, television and shown that way, would that be considered testimony? Could that be admitted and used as evidence? Well, history is full of such examples, and uh, I understand why uh, publicly it appears as uh, obvious well, it seems evidence. seems like a confession. Exactly, obvious evidence and admittance of the involvement. But uh, in a reality, in, a, in, in law, you would have to, the, the video itself, the interview, even if it was a self-made interview, uh, would not be enough. You have to prove that the individual had um, what you call not only de jure but de facto control, uh, command and communication with the uh, troops, let's call them for this purpose, on the ground that were committing the crimes. Just saying uh, we have to go and defend our people in this area and we will always defend them or we are glad that we liberated this, etc. You've, you've had it in Bosnia, you've had it in uh, uh, Iraq, you've had it in many different It is not enough to show that there was a criminal intent in the wish to get that political uh, advantage. All right, and final question. Um, they're in The Hague with these courts, and I think there's something like 160, 161 cases when it came to the former Yugoslavia. And you had a tremendous example of, you know, kind of prosecution and punishment. But you've said before there's a difference between that and reconciliation. Mm -hmm. What is the difference and what has been learned from the Yugoslav example about how to move forward and what, what's actually productive? Mm. Uh, I, I actually come from former Yugoslavia, although I haven't lived there for uh, many years. And the disappointing thing with the former Yugoslavia is that so many people, so many perpetrators, direct and high-ranking, were brought to justice from many different sides, but it had it didn't have the positive effect of reconciliation. And that is because without uh, differentiation, my, most all sides used the trials and the fact what the court was doing for political purposes to continue the propaganda war that existed during the conflict to continue it in the peace. So discrediting the trials, denying the evidence, the facts, the testimonies given, the documents shown, and always continuing to try and show that the other side was bad and not and we were not we are not as bad as the other side so this is the problem that remained in the former yugoslavia and remains now it's in bosnia it's 20 years uh, uh, after the almost 20 years after the end of the war and you still have that denial 
which means that people, you can never completely remove people from the area. Bosnia remains a uh, multi-ethnic society, but you have different ethnicities that are not embracing each other or recognizing each other's pain, and everyone is just sticking to their own point. And that's what's missing, and that's what I think is very important for any uh, country or society that goes through the conflict to bear in mind. As painful and as difficult it is to have an inner reflection on even when you are defending yourself from aggression, it is possible to commit uh, war crimes even in a just war, if you will, or in self-defense. And the sooner society starts dealing with those elements, with their own sides, uh, the sooner they will be able to, let's say, shake the hand with the opponent, uh, opponent's side. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. And we're back in Hromadske studio with another important conversation uh, for you. Our own uh, Natalia Humenyuk has spoken to Ivan Vojvoda, Vice President of German Marshall Fund, uh, about the reforms that Ukraine needs to do during these troubling times. The problem of legacy of the past time, problems of simultaneity, when you have lots of changes to be done at the same time. Let's watch the interview. What are the major challenges to make the reforms, especially in things in uh, such fields like a security, uh, in the post-conflict society, in the society during the time of conflict, when many people would speak about kind of reconciliation and also demanding some harsh actions? Well, it's, it's uh, mission impossible to use the title of a famous movie, but uh, I think the key thing is, is leadership and determination. And obviously the pressure from society, which was very clear from what happened uh, at the Maidan. Uh, people wanted to see the country go uh, in a certain direction. That was the direction towards Europe, uh, which means very simply uh, making your society better, uh, making rule of law uh, institutions and procedures such that the citizens feel that the system is geared towards their interests and not towards the interests of an elite whether it's a financial, economic, or political elite. Of course, the fact uh, that the country is also in a uh, military conflict makes it uh, very difficult at that same time to reform, as you said, the security services, the defense, but um, it's, uh, the metaphor has often been used. It's like repairing a ship uh, at sea in a storm. Uh, and it has to be done, because that's the only way that you create the foundations for that better society to go forward. And when we be precise and tactical, so for instance, moving from the, and for instance, let's speak about Serbia or the countries like that, who uh, had the different kind of army before and during the conflict, during the times of Milosevic, and there were things changed. So what are the critical things? Well, from the Balkan experience. Yeah. It doesn't mean that it should be taken for granted. Yeah, no, nothing's taken for granted. I mean, uh, our changes in Serbia, for example, really began when Milosevic left power uh, in 2000, when we decided to beat the regime through peaceful uh, means, through elections, democratic elections, and then really the hard work began. And the, the problem uh, with uh, the reforms is that you have to do them all at the same time. It's called the problem of simultaneity. You're reforming your state, you're reforming your economy, you're reforming your defense and secret services, you're reforming your education system, which again is a very important but long-term goal. These must be tackled at the same time in a way so that they don't fail. Uh, because the effort required of state officials, of elected officials, I is enormous. And then, obviously, you, need, you do need help, experts from the side to do these things. One of the biggest problems that we all have in former communist societies is the legacy of the old regime. By that, I mean you have bloated, you have over-employed people in ministry. You know, ministries have 1,500 instead of having 500 people. And so you have a social problem also. You have to lay off a lot of people so that you make the system more efficient. And what are these conditions to lay them off? Because that's also the something like uh, you know, putting an explosive device on hold. 
You are, because at the same time, all of our countries are going through an economic crisis because of the global economic crisis. So you don't have economic growth that would help uh, trade off the fact that you're laying off. So there are, there are many schemes. I mean, one is early retirement. That's, that's quote unquote, the easiest one. People who are close to retirement uh, and you give them a few years, uh, allow them to go forth on a voluntary basis. But then you have to seek ways in which you will give others an opportunity maybe to find something else in the private business. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation because you want a, a private economy that is thriving or doing not so badly so that it can absorb uh, some of the extra uh, people who will not be needed in the state apparatus. For example, just let me tell you in Serbia today, uh, just two weeks ago, our Deputy Prime Minister responsible for administrative reform because we're still going through this 15 years after the change of Milosevic are going to lay off about 9,000 people in the municipal administrations because they've identified there are simply too many people in, in it. And uh, another issue which, which uh, the conflict brings is definitely the armed group which had arms later. So what are also, there are different strategies and different uh, you know, ways to do that, but later on they remain in the society. And what are also, there is a different kind of experience, but what are the key things to have it, not, if not smooth, but they're acceptable by the society? I'm speaking about disarmament. I'm speaking about the, any kind of, recon, not just reconciliation, but amnesty. Uh, and as also how to make it that, you know, when there is a high level of conflict, then this kind of weapon and all weaponization of the society isn't going further. Well, I, I think uh, there, there was, we've had an interesting experience after 1989, and that's the former East Germany, the, the German Democratic Republic, as it was called. I think that's an example to look at because it was, of course, reunified with Germany, but because it was a communist country, the other half of Germany, it has to undergo all of these uh, changes, and all these people were demobilized, um, especially from the secret services and the military, and then the, the weaponry simply had to, uh, you know, it went to the junkyard um, or uh, in worst cases through organized crime and organized trading, it was sold off to third countries um, in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America. There have been many cases that were tried because obviously everybody will try to make some money if you have a whole stockpile of, of small arms, mid-sized arms or big arms. And uh, it's a question also thus of control of, of those mechanisms in the UN and obviously the US and European countries have uh, had very uh, difficult times. I know in Serbia, uh, people were caught um, trading with, with the surpluses uh, of the military. So these are all, uh, you know, to go back to your initial question, these are all very complex processes that require a huge determination and will especially on the part of the elected officials, because they need to put the public interest above their private interest. And that is really, I think, if that balance is right, that those whom we elect as, as voters really care about us, then the society will be going in the right direction. But I think I want to stress one point. This will take much more time than we all think. And so the society needs to understand this. And I think society will go along if they feel that it is going in the right, right direction. And we're back in this Joining us now, Anastasia Taylor Lind, independent documentary photographer, this year's Harvard Neiman Fellow, uh, contributor to the National Geographic magazine, and the author of Maidan Fortress of the Black Square. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. You have a very interesting project started with maybe not directly linked uh, to the photography called Postcard from Donetsk. Welcome to Donetsk, Postcard mm. from War. What is that about? Why did you decide to do it? Well, I was photographing in Slavyansk last summer. Um, the usual sorts of pictures that I'm used to taking, um, photojournalistic pictures of um, spaces that, and places and people that had been affected by war. And in those photographs, the people and the places looked like war zones. 
Um, and I was finding it hard to find a way to connect or to really feel um, what it must be like to be somebody who has war visited upon yourself upon you and your life and your home. And in Slavyansk post office, I found um, a series of postcards um, with the words, welcome to Donetsk, written in English on the front. Can I model them for you? <laughs> we will show them, we, we have pictures of them, we will show them on screen for oh, our we viewers as well. As well. Mm -hmm. And I was really taken aback and moved by this because in this picture and this postcard, Donetsk looks like anybody's hometown. Um, it could even be my hometown. And so um, it was that kind of interaction that um, encouraged me to find the publishing company who made these postcards um, a year later and to travel to Donetsk to buy what postcards they had, they had left, which were being kept in the basement of um, somebody, somebody's mother's basement. So you are sending those to real people, to yeah. your friends, who are receiving those postcards? <sighs> Well, um, it's it's m most of the people. I, I, I don't know who they I are. I follow you on Instagram. You, you invited people <laughs> to. You said, you know, if you send me your address, I will send you one of these postcards. Yeah. So it's open to people. Have you sent me your address yet? I, I didn't. <laughs> Shame <laughs> I on you. I tend not to get mail when people <laughs> send it to me, but I should. I'll do it now. I'll make yeah, up for it. Well, so I was. Um, I'm using. Uh, you know, this project is a real mix of kind of analog and digital forms of communication. So I'm using social media to ask people if they would like to be part of this project that's about the war in Ukraine, but I'm not telling them um, exactly what it is that they will receive. And Here's I just the asked picture for their we have. Mm -hmm. picture of a postcard on screen. Mm -hmm. So I just um, so I ask I ask for their address, and um, when I send the postcard to them, on the back of each postcard is written the name of one person who's been killed in the war, um, mm -hmm. and that name isn't repeated. So it's one name for one person. Um, I'll give you an example. Sure, sure, go ahead. Uh, so Vladimir Snezko was killed near Lugansk on Sunday, the 28th of September, 2014. So it's just a, one small attempt at um, personalizing the war, I guess, personalizing war stories. Well, what I, one thing I like so much about this project is um, we were talking about this before. When you have a war zone, the sort of pictures that are bought usually, especially if you're a freelance uh, photographer, I mean, same thing if you're writing, but it's the story about it. it's going to be something terrible violence, terrible destruction, and people kind of are surprised that everyday life goes on, that yeah. that can be next so to right. something that functions normally. Where then on postcards, you usually have the idealized form of a place, like something surreally beautiful, even more so than reality. Yeah, um, and that's what for me was so interesting about these postcards. You have the peaceful scene of what Donetsk was before the war, or what people imagined it to be, and then you have the violence um, on the back in the in the te in the form of the text. Even the names now, the the name Avdivka um, means uh, is loaded with uh, dread and mm -hmm. um, and fear and violence because of what we know happened in some of some of those places. Um, have you received feedback? Do you have a feeling? Um, of what is really interested, interesting for mm. people outside Ukraine? What do they really want to know and understand, really, mm. in, in, in this situation? So I started posting these, these postcards on Monday, and I've, um, I've written over 700 so far. So that's um, 700 name, the names of 700 of the more than 6,000 who've been killed in the, in the war so far. And slowly, in the last few days, I've started receiving some um, feedback and interaction, uh, again, through social media. So what people have been doing is taking the postcard, holding it up in their garden or in their street or in their living rooms, and taking a photograph of it and sending it back to me. Hmm. Um, some people have lit candles to remember the people who've been killed on. Mm -hmm. um, one person has um, have wrote and asked if it was OK to um, offer the postcard uh, in a fire of remembrance for people who've died. So mm -hmm. there are p some people are performing small ceremonies as well in a very personal way, mm -hmm. just for that person that so they now know about. So with this with this project, were you feeling that photography is pretty much not enough? Um, there's a photographic critic called uh, Val Williams, and she says that. Uh, all war photography is a parody of real war. And so what I'm trying to um, explore in my work now is how can I 
convey the experience? How can I understand, as somebody who has never had war visited on my country, we haven't had war in England for hundreds of years, how can I understand what that might be like? And um, for me, mass media isn't... In, doesn't do that. So if mass media is a way of reaching many people in a, in a very shallow and a very general way, um, I'm interested in experimenting with reaching one person mm -hmm. in a deeper and more meaningful way and moving somebody. Well, it's the personal that people connect to. I mean, I think that's part of why the, you know, the innate tragedy aside, but when people think about MH17, these, you know, guidebooks, traveling, children's toys, and additional to the bodies made that very personal and very real to people because otherwise yeah. the temptation can be these are countries where there's always war. You know, people see especially a communist building and they see it bombed out and there's almost, they assume that that's natural in a way, uh, but it's yeah, not. I agree completely. And, um, and one of the things I really learned here, although I've worked in many other countries, one of the things I really learned here in Ukraine was that nobody expects war to ever come to their town or mm -hmm. to ever to come to their homes. Nobody anywhere in the world expects that. Still, you, you, you turn to photography to tell very complicated stories, like the story of Maidan. And uh, it was obvious that you were trying to experiment with photography and to find your own personal way of telling the story of Maidan. If we could get the pictures from Anastasia's project on Maidan, just to, uh, just to explain a little, why did you decide to make, partic in particular, this, this sorts of uh, portraits, a little bit theatrical, not, not really, uh, I would say, documenting without all the, the scene, without all the, the, the background. Uh, why did you decide to make this, this project in this way? I guess um, the essence of that decision was probably based, again, on wanting to make um, a more personal um, photograph, of wanting to move people in a more personal way. When I saw photographs of men in masks throwing Molotov cocktails against a backdrop of fire and ice and smoke, um, that was this hugely dramatic backdrop, they looked like protesters. Mm -hmm. When they stood in my studio and they looked at me, and they in turn look at the person who looks at the photographs, you see their faces <laughs> once they're pulled out of that. So again, it was a creative decision, but also, but also um, a practical one, because as you mm -hmm. know, um, all of the world's media descended on Maidan. And it's not the job of any one individual journalist or photographer or writer to tell the whole story of any news event. Um, we each, if, we're, if we do our jobs right, have one small part to tell. And I saw this as my part. You, you uh, went, well, obviously went public with the story, you had a book published, and uh, you went on TED, actually, with a TED talk on Maidan. How were you received, and what was the reaction when you showed those pictures to, to people outside Ukraine? Probably some of them maybe didn't even know anything about Ukraine before. Yes, the way I, it's interesting you, you ask that. The way I speak about the work and where, um, the way I present the work outside of Ukraine is obviously very different to the way I would present it to Ukrainian audience. So I'm also having to give um, uh, a short uh, overview and background to the situation. M my work really isn't about news events or politics, mm -hmm. but still I need to set the scene for people so that they understand where they are and what's happening. Um, TED, the TED Talk has been a really great way to reach people who may not um, have been aware of what was happening in Ukraine already. Um, I think it's around six and a half thousand views um, of the talk so far. So mm -hmm. um, again, it's, it's an interesting way to reach people um, when I wasn't really able to do that through traditional printed media. When I presented the talk in Brazil, when I gave the TED Talk, um, uh, many people in the audience cried. So yeah, um, I find that people react, often react to the work. And that's what I want to do as a photographer, is to move, move people. To reach them. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My pleasure. All right, so that's the end of our program for tonight. We're going to be on summer break until late August. We'll keep you updated with all of that. And as always, we encourage you to listen to the podcast, you know, go to our website, watch the videos. But for now, have a good night. Until next time. Все починалося з малого. 
а потім все пішло не так. Сама ідея стрельнула в 2012 році, а сам процес започаткувався в 2013-му влітку, якщо не взимку. От це був квітень, але взимку були проведені розмови. Так що Майдан – це лише просто збіг обставин і не більше. Просто так встали зірки. Це там я маю на увазі для того, щоб ми прислужилися в цей момент суспільству, висвітлювали ті події, які розгорталися на Майдані. Журналісти там, де відбуваються найважливіші події. Тому громадське і на Майдані, і на Антимайдані, і в Криму, і в Донецьку, просто там, де відбувається найголовніше. Ми засновувалися основною подією, в Україні був Майдан. Тому про нього. Архітектори, автогонщики, живописці, екстремали, священники, шльондри, аваков, шльондри, аваков. Це все цікаво і ми про все це знімаємо вам. Громадське телебачення – це телебачення для всієї України за межами Майдану і поза часом Майдану. Ми просто висвітлюємо життя, як воно є. І завжди буде щось, заради чого буде існувати громадське. Просто звужувати це до Майдану, мені здається, це не зовсім чесно. Ми інформуємо, а не закликаємо. Наприклад, коли знімають і тушок, мені хочеться вилізти і почати кричати «Стадо! Скати!». Але я цього не роблю, тому що я журналіст. Моя справа – це просто відображати реальність, якою б вона не була. Ми – дзеркало. Журналісти не можуть бути активістами, вони роблять свою роботу, свою сферу. Як тільки вони переходять в розряд громадських активістів, вони автоматично втрачають об'єктивність і є зацікавленими в тому, що відбувається. Тому ми мусимо лишатися медіа. Журналіст, він має стояти насправді за всіма канонами над процесом. Хоча іноді таке трапляється, журналісти стають тимчасово на певний період активістами. Ми не намагаємося когось перетягнути на свою сторону і переконати, що тут є наша правда або ще щось. Ми намагаємося затримуватися стандартів, які для себе приписали, взявши за основу стандарти BBC, і намагаємося працювати, як працюють найкращі журналісти світу, не побачу цього. Ми не можемо собі дозволити бути просто активістами. А як би так зробити, щоб досягти такого результату від аудиторії, щоб вона відреагувала так, як це вигідно комусь? Власне, так працює процес. Ми собі цього дозволити не можемо, тому що у нас різні цінності. У пропагандистів навряд чи є найвищою цінністю довіра. У нас довіра – це найвища цінність, і, власне, цією мовою ми говоримо з аудиторією. Ми просто намагаємося показати те, що відбувається. Хто б це не казав. Часто просто показуючи пряму мову, і це вже точно не пропаганда. Пропаганда завжди є маніпуляцією. Журналістика і пропаганда є несумісними. Ми обрали шлях журналістики. Та, ну яка ми пропаганда? Нас часто запрошують. Навпаки, говорити про те, як не робити пропаганду іншим каналам. Напевно, це не канал пропаганди через тих людей, яких зібрало довкола себе громадське. Та зайдіть на наш Фейсбук, погортайте новини. Про що ми пишемо? Сьогодні це таємний бізнес президента Порошенка, завтра це надприбутки сім'ї Януковича. Нам байдуже, нічих інтересів ми не обслуговуємо, тому що нам ніхто не платить, нам платите ви. Ви наші папіки, ви наші грошові мішки, ви наші олігархи. Платіть нам і ми будемо розказувати те, що вигідно вам, а вам вигідна правда. Добрий вечір, 21.30, ні, 21.41, мали б 21.30, трошки затягнули наші колеги з громадського інтернесу, таке буває, це громадське телебачення. Отже, маємо підбити підсумок дня сьогоднішнього, сьогодні, нагадаю, неділя. Традиційно розпочнемо з інформації зони проведення антитеористичної операції Дмитро Гуцуляк, вечірній дайджест від прес-центру АТО. Протягом 19 липня ситуація на Сході України залишається стабільно неспокійною. Російськими брехливими засобами масової інформації поширена сенсація, що нібито банд формування відводять озброєння навіть калібру менше 100 мм від лінії розмежування. Але така інформація супроводжувалася черговими обстрілами позицій сил АТО із заборонених мінськими домовленостями калібрів артилерії танків. Особливо з мінометів калібру 82 мм. Також зазначимо, що все озброєння, 
згідно мінських домовленостей, давно відведена силами АТО на визначені відстані, про що неодноразово повідомляв прес-центр штабу АТО та вітчизняні журналісти. Щодня на окупованих територіях Донецької та Луганської областей зростає невдоволення відвердим бандитизмом, бойовиків та вбивствами. Цивільні мирні громадяни знають, що саме про російські бандформування причетні до обстрілів жилих кварталів, населених пунктів та міст Донбасу. Протягом дня позиції сил АТО зазнали обстрілів із забороненої зброї поблизу населених пунктів Опитне, Авдіївка, Кірово, Березове, Яснобродівка, Курдюмовка, Первомайське, Новотроїцьке, Піски, Станиця Луганська, Красногорівка, Лозове, Миколаївка. Найчастіше обстрілювали – Понад 20 разів позиції українських військових поблизу Мар'їнки. Захисники України відповідали зі стрілецької зброї. В чергове наголошуємо, позиції сил АТО розміщені поза межами населених пунктів, щоб убезпечити життя мирців від злочинних діянь проросійських злочинців. Захисники України, суворо дотримуючись мінських домовленостей, стійко отримують оборонні рубежі та готові до будь-якого розвитку подій. І є інформація від спеціальної моніторингової місії ОБСЄ, яка зазначає, що минулої ночі відновилися з'єднання між сторонами конфлікту. Про це заявив заступник голови місії Олександр Хуг в інтерв'ю російській BBC. Ми можемо підтвердити, що минулого вечора і вночі сталася серйозна дестабілізація ситуації. Вогонь направлявся з Донецьку у західному напрямку по позиціях українських сил, а у відповідь вогонь надходив у бік Донецька, зазначає Олександр Хуг. І наступна інформація стосовно діяльності Служби безпеки України, оскільки спеціалісти спецслужби разом з міліцією попередили теракт у місті Щастя Луганської області. Правоохоронці виявили саморобний вибуховий пристрій у підвальному приміщенні багатоквартирного житлового будинку. Бомба складалася з двох з'єднаних протитанкових мін ТМ-62М, тротилової шашки та детонаторів. Загальна вага вибухової речовини становили 14. 12 кілограмів, засіб ураження перебував у бойовому стані. Терміново було організовано евакуацію місцевих мешканців. Військові вибухотехніки знешкодили вилучені міни на полігоні за межами міста. Інші складові вибухового пристрою було направлено на експертизу. За фактом замаху на вчинення терористичного акту, слідчими Служби безпеки України відкрито кримінальне провадження. Досудове розслідування наразі триває. Встановлюються особи, причетні до підготовки цього теракту, зокрема в організації Ситуації злочину проти мирних людей обґрунтовано підозрюються представники Диверсійного центру незаконних збройних формувань так званої ЛНР або ж Луганської Народної Республіки. Ну і сьогодні ми спілкувалися телефоном із Наталкою Гуменюк, яка перебуває у відрядженні. Про ситуацію з перетином лінії зіткнення нам розповідала Наталка. Давайте згадаємо, що розповідала. Насправді, так, все-таки в будні цієї перефронтової зони, лінії розмежування, нам кажуть, що не діля, це спокійніший день, але все одно черги кілька кілометрів, якщо треба йти пішки, і це там для багатьох вже звична справа. Ми говорили з водіями, от зараз п'ята година вечора, є ще ті люди, які стоять з 11 години ранку, це означає... Один. Це було пост між Артемівськом і е, Горлівкою е, найбільший. Е, нам пояснюють, що сьогодні ситуація більш не спокійна. Е, один з водіїв сказав, що десь е, за три години він проїхав 600 метрів, а якщо йдеться про кілька кілометрову чергу, е, Насправді зараз більший рух, якщо виїжджати з території підконтрольної України. Напевно, найголовніше зрозуміти, що це щоденна річ. Блокпостиці працюють до 8 вечора. Від цього тижня тут з'явився такий медичний намет лікарів без кордонів. І вони воду привозять, говорять, що десь 20-30 людей на день звертаються, переважно. 
тривогу, це старі люди, у яких проблеми з тиском, величезна спека, але відносно для цього регіону це така для них ситуація спокійна, чого люди їздять, ну, в багатьох там родичі, діти, треба вести ліки, хтось доглядає за своїми будинками, які там залишилися в Донецьку, і це найбільший блокпост, і це, напевно, найголовніше, що треба сказати, що це ті будні, якими живуть останні місяці люди. Запитали ми про електронні перепуски. Так, отже, проти тут більшість людей, в яких були ці паперові перепуски, в середньому, ну, дві, два подружжя, з яким ми говорили, вони десь близько двох місяців їх робили, третьої спроби, але електронні вони є ще в базі, люди, як одного чоловіка бачили, який ніби зареєструвався електронно, але, мав, але його завернули, це був поки що один на всю чергу, але... Така є ситуація тут. Ще ми знаємо для тих, хто не орієнтується, що це найбільший блокпост, є ще подібний біль. Ну і повернемося до Мукачевого тимчасово слідча комісія Верховної Ради, яка розслідує події у місті, які склалися 11 липня, тимчасово не інформуватиме про хід розслідування. Про це повідомив один із представників цієї, цієї тимчасової слідчої комісії Ігор Мосійчук. Пише, що на засіданні ТСК прийнято рішення не інформувати поки що про хід розслідування подій в Мукачево, так як це почало шкодити самому слідству. Ввечері поінформую про те, що буде не шкод... що не буде шкодити об'єктивному розслідуванню. Однак більш докладніша інформація поки що немає на сторінці у депутата. Ну і знову ж таки, якщо говорити про події у Закарпатті, Служба безпеки України протягом доби виявили низку підпільних складів контрабандистів, звідки вилучено великі партії контрафактних цигарок. Про це повідомляє прес-центр Служби безпеки України, зокрема місця, де підконтрольні одному з організованих злочинних угрупувань контрабандисти зберігали контрафакт, виявлено у Виноградівському та Берегівському районах. Так, у складських приміщеннях одного з торгівельних центрів виявлено коробки з тютюнованими виробами, понад 100 відомих торгівельних брендів у приватних помешканнях двох мешканців села Виноградів та села Вілок. Вилучено понад 150 ящиків цигарок без акцизних марок. У одного з цих громадян знайдено помпову рушницю Вінчестер із набоєм. Йдеться у повідомленні. І мусимо сказати, що є інформація стосовно вчорашніх обстрілів Донецька. Близько 20.00 вчора почався обстріл центра міста. Як повідомили громадському, загинув, на жаль, один мирний мешканець у результаті цих обстрілів, які відбува... потрапляння зафіксовано поблизу супермаркету Амстор на вулиці Університетській. Сам вже будинок загорівся, бачите картинку з місця подій. Крім того, в лікарні Вишневського поранено було лікаря, однак хворих не евакуювали. Як повідомляли місцеві мешканці в соцмережах, вогонь по центру міста відкривався з південного сходу з мінометів і, як зазначається, точка міста, що опинилася під обстрілом, розміщена тільки в межах досяжності мінометів бойовиків. Ну і так само було оприлюднено радіоперехоплення в якому, з якого чітко зрозуміло, що бойовики розмовляють саме про цей обстріл. І це радіоперехоплення. Пропонуємо вам послухати за півхвилини. Ну а сьогодні відбувся, відбулася прес-конференція заступника керівника антитерористичної операції, а також представника від України у спільному центрі з контролю припинення вогню. І, власне, під час цієї прес-конференції українські військовослужбовці виклали свою версію того, хто саме стріляв вчора по центру Донецька. Особенностю ведення наблюдения наблюдателями совместного центра является то, что у нас из всех технических средств только бинокль. Наши наблюдатели видели направление, из которого, где выстрел. Это направление показывает четко, что стрельба велась 
из, с территории, которая размещает, расположена на контролируемые боевиками. Пардон. Видели взрывы, вспышки от взрывов после того, как эти выстрелы были ослены. Эти взрывы были в районе города Донецк. Технических средств других, типа радиолокационных станций, контрбатарейной борьбы, у нас в совместном центре нет. Эти средства есть в штабе АТО, в подчинении штаба АТО, и именно поэтому они оказались способны определить координаты огневых позиций, откуда вел Сагуль, и координаты, куда после этого попали эти выстрелы. Коли вы нужны очки детально открывать, кто информацию о факте применения огня боевиками по по кварталам именно Донецка мы получили и подтвердили по трем источникам. Во-первых, да, мы отвели артиллерийские подразделения, но артиллерийские средства разведки по передку у нас остались и ведут разведку позиций стреляющих орудий и минометов противника. Это первый источник, который дал нам координаты. Во-вторых, данные радиоперехвата, которые ведут наши разведчики. И в-третьих, у нас есть возможность проверять информацию среди местных жителей и уже с вечера мы получали э, и социальные сети, потом это дело подтвердили обычно в открытой переписке, что люди видели, откуда вы, где вы ставили свои э, системы, как они стреляли, куда стреляли, и откуда что падало. Поэтому э, я считаю, что то количество источников, которые мы получили, плюс информация совместного центра, э, я думаю, более чем достаточно, чтобы уверенно говорить, что да, стреляли боевики, да, стреляли по мирным кварталам Донецка. Ну і сьогодні було прилюднена, була прилюднена заява президента стосовно конституційної реформи. Гарант виклав своє бачення її і, власне, зазначив, що досить полку дискусію викликала в суспільстві конституційна реформа і відповідні закони, які були прийняті парламентом цього тижня. Каменем спотикання стала норма, яка міститься в перехідних положеннях Конституції, а саме Речення, в якому згадується закон про специфічний порядок здійснення місцевого самоврядування, підкреслює місцевого, в окремих районах Донеччини і Луганщини. Цей закон депутати вже ухвалювали двічі. Спочатку його прийняла попередня Верховна Рада, а потім удосконалила теперішня. Вступити в силу такий закон може лише після виконання цілої низки попередніх умов. Ці умови включають і роззброєння бойовиків, і виведення російських військ, і відновлення нашого контролю над всією лінією українсько-російського кордону, і проведення чесних, вільних і демократичних місцевих. Ось таким видався тиждень. Записи сьогоднішніх студій вже можете переглядати на Ютубі. Більшості з них. Звати мене Сергій Мельничук. Побачимося з вами у середу. До нових зустрічей.